we're here to talk about script writing specifically, so I want to talk about you as a filmmaker. But I mean, in, in terms of script writing, I wonder what kind of writer you are. Are you the kind of writer who is happy with the first draft when something delights you on every page and when every scene sings to you? Or, or is it a question of getting to the point where nothing appalls you and makes you actually want to shoot yourself? Is anybody like the first part of that? Maybe. I mean, people um, raise their hands. Uh, <laughs> the idea of everything delighting me is seems <laughs> like... Uh, um, uh, but that's why I keep trying, <laughs> looking for that moment. Well, I, I, when I think about script writing, it really is intertwined with directing for me, I, 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 and editing too. I really do experience the whole process as one. And I don't, um, and, and, we, and, we, and, and I want to talk about screenwriting, but I, I, I'm, but I do, I, I, I I do find a script that's that isn't a movie um, of, of my own uh, somewhat useless. Like I don't think I don't find I don't I don't think scripts maybe some are somewhere, but I don't think they're complete things. They're by nature potential, and and uh, and uh, you know they've been called blueprints or you know. Um, uh, and some directors use them very much as just guides that, you know, Robert Altman, you know, would kind of make an entirely new movie out of the script he was given. I follow my scripts uh, quite closely. I'm interpreting them as a director, but I'm, I'm following we, we, the, the lines of the, the lines and, and um, uh, the scenes of the scenes. But even so, on their own, I don't... Um, I don't get a lot of delight out of them, I guess I should say. But, but I, um, the way I work is, and I edit the way I, pretty much the way I write, which is um, often I, now anyway, I sit down to write when I kind of feel like I have enough to start and I take a lot of notes and always. And, and often there's a few different things that are sort of, going on at once and one thing kind of announces itself and that when that wire kind of like electricity goes through that wire I I try to follow it but once I have a like scenes or, or a beginning or something I tend to I tend to work forward and go back and revise and then go a little bit further and then go back and revise so by the time I'm done with the script it's close to being ready, which is the same way. I, I don't have a rough cut. I, I start at the beginning with the, my editor, Jen Lame, and we, we cut the movie. Uh, we go a little bit, and then we go back, and we revise, same thing. So that when we're done, uh, it doesn't mean we, of course we make changes throughout, but, uh, and once you see it all together, it gives you other ideas. But the, um, but it's generally in very good shape. I, I, don't, I don't sort of throw it up there roughly and then uh, that I find too disheartening, I think. It's funny, I remember going to Manhattan for the first time in the 90s, and at that point, I think it was that kind of Tarantino moment. And you had scripts which were being sold on the streets. So you had like bootleg scripts. It doesn't sound like you were the kind of person who was seeking those out as, as sort of those almost fetishistic objects. I'd never of seen itself. a script um, until I wrote one. And it was before Final Draft, you know, or any of these screenwriting um, programs. And my first movie, Kicking and Screaming, was the first script I'd ever seen, which is, I had to actually write it to see it. And I, I had so much trouble with the tabs, getting the formatting, because right. you know, it was before. <laughs> so I just, my whole experience, mental memory, or emotional memory, I should say, of, of, that, um, of that process was just hitting tab and trying to center, you know, Grover with the line. And I, I, I spent so much time trying to get it to look like a script. That was the important yeah, stuff, Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And, and, and then I looked at some scripts to, just for the formatting. I had bought scripts you could buy, uh, not, not on the street, I didn't know about those, but I, um, um, I bought published scripts, but they were often, or the ones I had were all kind of transcripts of the right. finished movie. They didn't look like uh, scripts that, as, as I've now come to understand them. In terms of looking at the scenes you played just now and then finding sort of connective tissue to your work, 
it feels like place is a very obvious one, that, that actually, you know, whether that's Venice or whether it's Lumberton, there's this sense of place which is more than just, it's never just a location. Right. It's always very much the essence of the film. And that really feels like something that you've brought through in your work as well. Yeah, and, yeah, and what's interesting about Blue Velvet is it's, it's very specific, but it's very generalized at the same time. Lumberton or Lumber, you know, it's, wh wh where is that? You know, I mean, but it seems we all know where it is, but we have no idea where it is, um, which is amazing. Um, yeah, place is a big part of it, and I um, and I'd like to know the place when I'm writing. Um, I mean, obviously, I need to know the place for it, but I mean, I like to even have visual ideas of the streets, the the, the locations, if I can, um, when I'm writing. Because uh, I feel like it grounds me. It's for the same reason I often use real names in my scripts of people I know, um, n not because I'm writing about them at all. I would never do that, but but, but um, because it's immediately a real person to me. I believe it. Uh, I, well, like I know that I know who Roger Greenberg is because I grew up with Roger Greenberg. Right. Um, he wasn't Roger Greenberg in Greenberg, but he. Um, because I also because I hadn't seen him since I was like 15, but but um, but I had deep affection for him and for that time in my life. And even though the movie had no literal connection to that, calling him Roger Greenberg made me love him, right. and 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 also it made it real to me. I mean, you mentioned Brooklyn in your lecture, um, and Brooklyn obviously has this pivotal role. And again, it's that sense Brooklyn is not just a place, it's a, a source of drama, a source of conflict sometimes. You have that relationship between Manhattan and Brooklyn, which comes up in your work. You know, yeah. now you have in Marriage Story, New York and LA. So it's less Brooklyn specific, although it is Brooklyn. But then it's also New York and it's the other coast as well. Yeah, it's also home. I think notions of home and that come up in my movie. I mean, even my first movie, Kicking and Screaming, they're by design not at home, but they're, they're in college, but it's become a kind of surrogate home that they don't want to leave. And this sort of being fixed and associated with a place and how that can be, uh, uh, that can hold you back or it can propel you forward, you know, and, and you know, place and family and home. I mean, all these things then can become versions of each other. A marriage story in New York and LA in some ways become stand-ins for once the lawyers use them as arguments in their divorce, it's they become representative of the characters themselves, you know, and um, and that's true, but it's also not true. Yeah, we tend to think of our place as the kind of person we are, don't we? But as you say, that's but but Brooklyn, Brooklyn, to what you're saying. I mean, I, I have a strong connection. To, uh, I feel like a lot of what I I'm doing as a creative person is is. Is, is a conversation or maybe a sort of silent conversation with my younger self who loved movies. I mean, I think it's why I was drawn to talk about what I talked about is that I'm always talking to that, to that person who was discovering movies for the first time and so excited about them. And so often I'm drawn to the world of, of, of that time as well, even if I'm not, Squid and the Whale was actually that time in my life, but, the, um, uh, but even when the movies take place, say, in the present, it, it's still, in some sort of cinematic way, I'm sort of still conversing with that boy. We're going to shortly queue up another clip from Francis Ha. I mean, that's a particularly fascinating thing. I want to pick up a thread, really, because Francis Ha is a film which is seen as, as not about you. It's a, you know, it's a different generation, it's a different gender, but I'd be fascinated to know in which way Greta and you kind of merge on, on the screen. But, sure. I mean, do you want to say anything about Francis Ha before we look at the clip? Well, it's I think again, it, New York is by It's a good, I think it's the beginning of the movie, right? So, again, well, Francis Ha also was, I, I think, even more directly inspired, in my mind anyway, by Jules and Jim's opening. Uh, it, and it's, you know, it is about friends, mm -hmm. and it's also about, you know, friendship as, as love, a, sort of a love story between friends, and the story, of course, is, is about that bond, but also, you know, it's a, about individuals and a pair at the same time, which marriage story is too. Um, uh, but, you know, you can show the clip and sort of see how I was sort of, you know, introducing Again, the sort of language of the movie that, that you were going to later see. Absolutely. Well, let's look at this clip from Francis. Hall.
tried to make a frittata, but it's really more of a scramble. This is interesting. To praise a work of literature by calling it sincere is now at best a way of saying that although it may be given no aesthetic or intellectual admiration, I should sleep in my own bed. Why? Because I bought it. Stay. But take off your socks. I haven't seen that in a while, actually. Uh, just a quick, uh, the, the world premiere of Francis Howe was at the Telluride Film Festival, which is an amazing festival. Um, we were just, we were there with Marriage Story, and I, I love it. Um, but we were premiering the movie, and, and no one knew we, we'd even made the movie because we kind of made it sort of under the radar. And um, uh, so it was very exciting, you know, here it goes. And there was some, uh, the movie began and there was music and picture, but I knew because there's also a di like a low dialogue soundtrack, you know, ambient track underneath, that wasn't playing. Uh, and, and, uh, but, there was no way that anyone who didn't know the movie would know. So I turned to the person, the you know, friendly person with the headset who was next to me in case there was a problem and told them, you know, you gotta turn it off, you gotta turn it. And um, just not, it sort of takes the mystery and drama out of showing a movie when you're like, we're gonna have to restart. Um, and so they stopped the movie sort of partly way in and then, then they, a few minutes and then they show it again, it's the same problem again. And then, so then they stop it again, and you're really losing the momentum of your <laughs> worldwide premiere. Um, but I did have to explain to people that the movie is actually in black and white. Right. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> at that point, I think they were all like, good, it's also the color's off. We'll get to it. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. So third time, lucky, did it? Did it the third forward? time it played as it was supposed to. I, of course, in my imagination, there was somebody like, oh, you know, plugging in the thing. But really, you know, that thing in movies where the, the thing's just not, but I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was more sophisticated than that. But, um, it's such a beautiful scene though, because it feels so haphazard and it feels so random. It feels like a sort of box of snapshots that you've just sort of stumbled upon. And then you realize by the end of it, you have, you've given us so much Information, information is a very unsexy word, but it's also vitally important in movie storytelling. And it's this incredibly, again, I mean, it's a high praise. It's a very functional scene. You know, you've told yeah. us a lot. Well, that's I mean, it's interesting. I mean, again, going to the clips that we looked at in the beginning, which are, I mean, they're poetry, but they're also, they're just, as you say, they're absolutely functional they really just tell the story I mean they, they I mean in that Ernst Lubitsch clip you learn so much so quickly mm -hmm. and you get the trash gondola which is like you know it's like amazing um, and uh, it's um, you know and, and as I was saying about Goodfellas and Jules and Jim they actually just tell you exactly what you need to know um, I mean we don't use voiceover here but but we did because we didn't need it and it wasn't the style of the movie but the the um, but yeah, and then of course, and I'm even watching it now, looking at them fighting in the beginning, and it's a play fight, but they're fighting, and I'm like, you know, that, that of course is sort of what the movie's about too, you know. Um, uh, but, um, th I mean, this movie was, a, in some ways, like it was as I was making it, it was a movie I, I, I needed to make, and, but almost didn't know it. I, I wanted to make a movie in a different, way than I had before, and, I, and in a sense, I, I felt like I wanted to make the first film I had, uh, my first film all over again, or a fil first film I never did make. And, and I was also exploring working digitally for the first time, which, I mean, I've since gone back to film. Marriage Story is shot on film. Meyerwood Story is before it was shot on film. Um, but I, I wanted to, to shoot with a very small crew and kind of not 
the sort of notion of like, we don't need to tell anybody. Why do you always have to like tell everyone you're making a movie? Let's just go make something, you know? If, if you know, we, the conversation we're having right now could be in the movie if we were recording it and filming it. So let's just do that. And Greta and I wrote this script, but it really did, I think also shooting in black and white, sort of going to your sense of place. I was shooting in New York again. I had shot Greenberg in LA before, so I was coming back to New York. And I think seeing New York with kind of fresh eyes, literally in a different, with no color, in a, in a different way, and in a different medium with digital, instead of, it, it, it freed other things up, even in the storytelling and in the, um, and, and I love that about making movies, because it's sort of what I was saying, too, about the things you know and the things you don't. And if you, I find more and more, if you focus on the storytelling, the, the really, uh, the sort of what you're saying, the functionality of things, then you'll back into some more magical or, or, or uh, you know, things that can be misconstrued as profound. <laughs> you know? uh, good, 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 good. I mean, was the writing process a, a kind of a question of relearning as well? Because uh, filmmaking is collaboration, of course, but I mean, writing, at least at first draft stage, isn't. I mean, writing, if you're writing solo, you know, you're there, you are for that moment the executive, but here you're collaborating with Greta from the, from the, from the word go with the script. I mean, how much of a change did that represent for you? Well, I had collaborated with Wes Anderson on the movies that he directed, but this was the first time I collaborated with somebody where I was directing it and um, yeah it was it was it, but it, it, it's less lonely um, for sure um, and what's nice about it is it is about conversation although Greta and I weren't in the same place very often when we wrote Francis Ha uh, um, we were a lot of it was done individually and then emailed back and forth and then we would revise each other's, and then I would sort of collect this bigger script as a whole, and we would, and start putting it together. Um, uh, it's funny because it is. I mean, I get asked the question a lot, about, you know, about autobiography and my movies, and the one I get asked the least is. I mean, you you were alluding to this, I think, in your introduction to it. The the one I get asked the least about is Francis Ha, because people don't see me as a 27 year old female, um, uh, but it actually, I, I, I think a lot about it. There's a lot of how I, you know, I, I went through a period after I made, I made two movies when I was quite young. I made Kicking and Screaming when I was 24, 25, and then movie Mr. Jealousy when I was 27. And then I didn't make another movie till I was 34 or something, or 34, 35 with Squid and the Whale. And that period for me was a period of, of real struggle. And it, in my sort of conscious mind, I was, I was just trying to get another movie made. I was writing things, trying to get another movie made. What I was doing unconsciously uh, was growing up. And, and I felt very much like, I mean, Frances talks at some point, someone says, what do you do? And she goes, well, it's hard to describe. And they say, why? She goes, because I don't really do it. And I felt that way. I had made two movies, but I didn't feel like I could call myself a filmmaker because I wasn't doing it. And I wanted to do it again, but I wasn't doing it. And it was a, it was a very hard time. And, and I, I emotionally reflected a lot on that time from from my point of view, I mean, so much of Greta's in the movie too, obviously, um, but um, uh, you know, in in that sort of you know what what I guess they call quarter life uh, uh, crisis. It's no, it's just fascinating hearing you talk because also, I mean, I think people do think of Francis Hart as as Greta's film, but from what you're saying, it almost feels as if there's a timeless quality, both to the change in Brooklyn and also to you know, Greta at 27, then there is still part of you at 27, a little further down the line. Yeah. And it's so culturally specific. It's about, you know, and while we're young, is, is the same thing happens there. More Very so culturally specific about, about Brooklyn now. But from what you're saying, Although it's still... with Francis, I feel like it, it is culturally specific, you're right, but it is be, part of the choice to do it in black and white was to put it out of time too. Right. And while we're young is more, I feel like in time, in time uh, it, it culturally specific and it's, um, 
and, and maybe even has some limitations because of that. Um, Francis, I do feel like, it, and also the use of the music, it is all George Delarue music. In the, in the, there's some other songs that we, there's a Paul McCartney, there's David Bowie's Modern Love that she runs mm -hmm. to. Um, but uh, it, it was all by design to kind of, I felt in a way to sort of, um, to honor her, you know, that, that you have this, you know, in, in, in a certain sense, an ordinary life. Uh, and I, but for all of us living it, it's extraordinary. And I wanted the movie to kind of, to, to, to react in kind and, and give back to her. And that's what that music does. We've got another clip of Marriage Story to look at, but I wonder, just before we, we play it, because it speaks to this point, I mean, did the character of Francis and also working with Greta, did it improve you as a writer? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if for no other reason, I was just trying to impress her. I, 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 um, <laughs> she would send me scenes and I'd be like, oh boy, this is so good. It was, so, it was like so exciting, um, you know, to the point that, you know, you'd, I'd just like, if I knew maybe a scene was coming, I would just be like refreshing email, hoping that it would come through. Um, it, yeah, it, 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 um, it would always, I, I was always, made me feel good if she like, liked what I sent her and, or, and, um, or laughed at a thing or something like that. And, um, but it, it, so certainly on those movies, but it, I think it, 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 I know it has, I've improved um, I've improved as a human being because of her, but I've improved as a as a writer and director, at least in my eyes, um, uh, from watching her, from working with her and watching her and watching her movies now too. Let's pick up this thread after this next clip from Marriage Story. We can accept an imperfect dad. Let's face it, the idea of a good father was only invented like 30 years ago. Before that, fathers were expected to be silent and absent and unreliable and selfish. And we can all say we want them to be different. But on some basic level, we accept them. We love them for their fallibilities, but people absolutely don't accept those same failings in mothers. We don't accept it structurally, and we don't accept it spiritually, because the basis of our Judeo-Christian whatever is Mary, mother of Jesus, and she's perfect. She's a virgin who gives birth, unwaveringly supports her child and holds his dead body when he's gone. And the dad isn't there. He didn't even do the fucking. God is in heaven. God is the father and God didn't show up. So you have to be perfect and Charlie can be a fuck up and it doesn't matter. You will always be held to a different, higher standard. And it's fucked up, but that is the way it is. Do you, have the, do you want to show the screenplay clip? Um, well, let's just pick up okay. the conversation here, because I think it's worth saying, actually. It's interesting. You, you applauded then. I mean, I think when the film's been on the festival circuit for the last few months, I mean, there has been quite a lot of spontaneous applause at that scene in particular. Um, I mean, I wonder, do you feel like you could have written that without having co-written Francis half uh, Probably not. I mean, I, I also without knowing Laura was playing it, I, 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 I th a lot of... The impetus for that scene came from talking to Laura, because I, 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 Laura and Adam and Scarlett I'd had I, I, involved in the movie even before I was writing it. Um, and one thing that I was talking to Laura about in playing this character, was, if you haven't seen the movie, is a divorce lawyer, um, and was and we were talking about it even from an actor's perspective of, of like what, what, what got her into this job in the first place. So what is, what is you know, it wasn't always, uh, you know, Machiavellian or, you know, or, or uh, you, know, she, you know, she's obviously very good at working within the system and the system is Kafkaesque in a, in a way, um, not to quote the squid and the whale. <laughs> but um, it, so it was this sort of notion of that she got into it to crusade f for people and for women in particular. And uh, so that was kind of the thought, like, and I thought, well, then we should hear that. That should come forward. Um, and working on that scene with Laura was amazing, too, because there were so many ways 
to envision it. Like, and I would, you know, just say, you know, like, why don't you say it now? Like you're having these ideas more for the first time. Why don't you say it now? Like it's prepared. Why don't you try it now? Like you get angrier as you tell it, you know, and one is that it's almost cathartic as you're, you know, and, and, and she could just dial it in and out. And, and, um, so it was, it was, you know, that's just one of those sort of fun days at work, but Greta is very much in that too. I mean, I mean, I think in, in, in writing it too, it was like, I would talk to her about it as well. And throughout this whole movie and, and, you know, I mean, we were very much involved in each other's work, even the ones that were not, uh, uh, working on, you know, officially together, we're, we're always very involved in each other's work. In terms of your relationship with, with actors, how much of a joy is it for you to almost, just in a second, relinquish control to them? Because obviously you can control what's on the page, but then once, once it's with an actor, it can't help but become something different. I mean, is that a pleasure for you? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I actually find that, I mean, in some ways, working with actors is not dissimilar to what I was saying about writing uh, in that, if you get the basics right, you know, the, again, the storytelling, the efficiency, the, you know, not, the, 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 a sequence, um, other things start to reveal themselves in, in the work and suddenly you see, oh, that's in there too. Well, now I can detour a little here because I've got this, you've got the framework, you have the structure, I can now do this little aside and this little thing here and, and maybe, break, like I said, break a rule here. Um, and I find that that's, it, it, for me, in, in, in a way, the, I mean, Elia Kazan always talked about being a prop, you know, people would say, you know, talk about what a good director he was with actors. He said, I'm a prop director. You know, I come up with good props for them and things for them to do. And that gives them ideas and it, it opens them up. And I, and, I, and I know what he means. I mean, I think giving them a framework and a structure um, uh, you know, all the scenes are are, um, are very blocked out, and we we have it really down to every little moment, and the dialogue is all precise. But then, just as you say, then they I feel like it gives them all the freedom in the world to to be present, to be, just be in the you know to. To, to find the truth of what's going on and find their truth and, and working with actors like this too who are alive to every, everything that's different in the moment and everything different that they give if it, they're in a scene with somebody else. Um, uh, even if they're off camera, you know, they'll change based on the reaction that they're getting. You know, Adam Driver in the movie, you, you know, will, you know, he'll say, we'll do a few takes and I'll be feeling pretty good. And then he'll say, you know, I'm, I'm gonna try it not crossing my legs this time. Right. And I know to him that means something else is gonna happen. Yeah, it's because he's changing his reality and changing his physical posture. It's, it, it's all, you know, he's so, he's so aware of how all of these things factor into performance. And, um, and I try to, give actors as much of that as I can or that I think of, you know, and I might say to an actor, maybe don't cross your legs or maybe stand up this time because I feel like, you know, it'll change something, you know, and that's exciting. And I, and I do relate it to writing in that way. No one's sadder than I to have to do this, but we're, gonna, we're out of time. Uh, we're going to have to leave it there, but please, Noah Bornbach. Thank you. Thank you.